Hello, everyone. Welcome to week five. This week, we are going to understand wind. So, I want to use this video to go over lecture presentation number three,、uh, and also provide other detailed instructions on your assignments. So, let's get started. Okay. So this is our lecture number three. Understand air pressure and wind. You are going to read essentials of meteorology. Okay, this book, chapter six and chapter seven. Okay, so、uh, here is the first one. Okay, those are the、uh, key concepts we are going to learn in the next two weeks. So chapter six will be this week. Chapter seven, I suggest you save save that to the next week. Okay.、Uh, yeah, let's get started. So what is pressure? So in your first in your first discussion of this week, week five, you are going to summarize these concepts. Okay. So、uh, to you need to. Provide a very thorough summary about what you learned, what you have learned about those、uh, key concepts. Okay, so basically, you are going to an answer all these questions. Okay, answer all these questions based on what you read in our textbook, and also through this lecture presentation, and also、uh, the videos I provided on the study guide. Okay, so make sure you answer all these questions. Let's get started. My presentation. So,、uh, what is air pressure, right? So, what is air pressure? Air pressure is a force per unit. So, basically, if you have some force, for example, I'm pressing my my table, okay, and you have a area, right, subject to those pressure, okay. <laughs> Uh, pressed by me, so you use this force divided by the size of that、uh, area. That is pressure. Okay, so then pressure is、um, you know、uh, everywhere. So why air molecules can give can produce air pressure? Okay, very two important reasons I want you to memorize. Number one is the air molecules they're moving. Okay, they constantly moving. Even we cannot see it. So, for example, if this is the air molecule, it strike on my face, right? Was just the、uh, give me my face the force, and there's an area. So this is the pressure. One reason you have the air pressure. The other reason is you the、uh, air molecules they have weight. They are heavy. So that is why in I think previous. Lecture two, when we learn the、uh, lecture one, when we learn the basics about atmosphere, you know,、uh, at the air pressure when you go up, air pressure fast decrease, right? Like here, like、uh, let me annotate, okay? Like here, fast decrease. Why? Because you can see if you are sending here. You have more molecules above you, right? If you're standing here, you have less molecules, air molecules above you. So that is why. Okay, two. So two reasons: weight and movement. Okay. Another thing very important is air pressure is on every surface, on、uh, to in all directions, not just pushing down, also pushing to the roof, you know, the wall and every surfaces. Okay, so、uh, watch the video on our study guide. You will see a very fun video about how heavy the air is. Okay, and actually, believe or not, if you walk into a gym,、uh, like our course of、uh, course at gym by the course of field, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of there.、Uh, you, the air, the weight of the air is like an elephant. It's a lot, right? But why? No one get crushed, right? <laughs> Because your body also produce pressure,、uh, pushing outside. Okay, it's balance out. <laughs> All right. Okay. So that is the air pressure. Oh, here I also have a、uh, there a lot of、uh, air pressure experiments. Okay. Speaking of all those、um, uh, inside pressure, you have the experience, right? If you go 
uh, higher mountains, you feel short of breath, right? Okay, that's because outside the air, the pressure is lower. You have harder time to take those air molecules in. Right, so that is why you need to carry the uh, the uh, oxygen bottle, right? <laughs> okay, and you to to the higher altitude, you also feel your air, your ear, your ear uh, pop, right? That's another pressure. Okay, all right. So let's go to the other direction. Uh, the uh, the next one. Let me clear my drawings. Okay, so. Uh, then, in our meteorology, okay, speaking of weathers, okay, we want to understand in which condition you can have high pressure, in which condition you have a low pressure, okay? So here, before we get started, I want you to pay attention to this part, okay? Here should be compared at the same elevation when we're speaking of high low pressure, okay? Same elevation, because as long as you go up, air pressure for sure decreasing. So we're not comparing that direction, okay? In the same, same uh, elevation, okay? So very simple, cold air produce high pressure, okay? Sinking air means descending air produce high pressure. Why? Because, well, cold air, they're denser, okay? Denser air, they're heavier, right? So they will give you, because of the weight, they will give you a higher pressure. Makes sense. Okay, how about descending air? That is due to the air movement. So when the air pressing down, right, okay, to the ground, on the ground, you will have a higher pressure, okay? Opposite warm air, rising air, you have the low pressure, okay? Very important, guys, remember this. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, here we go. And, well, the elevation, right? Elevation, when you go up, always have lower pressure, okay? Always have a lower pressure. That is why when you go to the mountain Everest, <laughs> you can see, well, if the ground the, is this many millimeter mercury and Mount Everest, well, it's uh, like one third of that, <laughs> right? So, yeah, the air pressure decreasing really fast. Another fun part, a fun factor affecting air pressure is moisture. I got this one wrong when I first started. So I was thinking moist air should have should be heavier, right? You should have higher pressure. But actually, no. <laughs> moist air, you have less air density. Okay, that one is more important. You have lower pressure. Okay, <laughs> so here is my um, video explanation. Why? Why is this? Okay, and dry air, actually you have a more air density, you will have a higher pressure, okay? So memorize those factors because we are going to determine high-low pressure later. <laughs> okay, and then here is a measurement, okay? Uh, commonly used uh, uh, air pressure, uh, the instruments measure air pressure changes are called barometer, okay? A uh, barometer was uh, invent invented many, many years ago. And here is the history. It's a very fun part. We are still using this instrument, this dish of mercury and the vacuum tube to, uh, to uh, study air pressure and also as a unit of the air pressure. Millimeter mercury means at the sea level, okay, at 15 degrees Celsius, okay, normal temperature, uh, this air pressure can press this mercury into this vacuum cube. And the height is from here to the dish is seven, uh, is 760 millimeter mercury, okay? But we do have other uh, unit 
to measure air pressure. So basically, one atm means one standard atmosphere pressure equals to this many millimeter mercury. That equals to this many hectopascal. <laughs> equal to, uh, equals to the same amount of millibars and psi. What is psi? Psi, uh, pounds per square inch. So that means every square inch, you will have 14.7 air pressure if you have a sea level, if you add, you are at the sea level. That's a lot, right? And here, mean sea level air pressure is this number. Okay, I want you to memorize it. Okay, then uh, here, how let's play with the air pressure maps. Okay, so where to download it, you can go here, okay? But the daily air pressure map. Well, but there are several things we need to understand what's going on on this map to, to be able to read it, okay? So first of all, that is those lines. We call them isobars. Memorize that concept, okay? Isobars means the lines connecting the points of equal pressure. Okay, and H means high pressure area. Okay, high pressure area. Usually they're in a region or a circle. We also call them high pressure cell or low pressure cell, like this one. Okay, and numbers on the isobars basically indicate uh, the, the pressure number, you know, on this line for all the locations. Okay, and isobar spacing is very important. If you see the spacing very narrow over here, okay, between Arizona, uh, New Mexico, okay, these places, you will have higher wind because you can see the isobar, uh, 10, 20 millibar, and uh, 10, 12 millibar, and 10, 8, oh, 10, 8 milli, 10, 1,008 millibar is very close to each other, right? Means air pressure change a lot, and that will affect our wind speed, okay? All right, okay. So then how surface map, surface map produced, surface air pressure map produced? Uh, because here's the question, you will read more on your textbook. Uh, we, we, ha we have this map, let me go back, the air pressure map is at the sea level, right? But we don't have the observations, you know, the, the weather stations at all at the sea level. We have the mountains. So basically you have readings right here. You have readings right here, right? So we actually need to calibrate it all the way to sea level. So you can see, for example, if you have 952 millibar measured at point A, okay, and point A is about like 600 meter above sea level, okay, then you need to increase this much millibars when you calibrate it to the ground reading 10, 12 millibar, okay, and so on, so forth, so on, so forth. We just remember, just remember, as long as you go up, pressure decrease. So if you go down, air pressure should increase, right? So this is the average rate. Every 100 meter, you increase if you go down to the, to the sea level, okay? 10 millibar per 100 meter. And then when you have those readings, you just connect the dots with same, you know, readings, okay? So here is how we produce the sea level air pressure map. But uh, upper charts, upper charts means above the sea level, okay? We're talking about thousands of meters, okay? Thousands of feet. How that produced? Well, first of all, upper level charts is a little bit different from your sea level charts because upper level charts is not a flat one, you know? You have this, uh, um, you know, up and downs, like a terrain, like a surface. So upper level charts actually measure height, measure to which level you can find a certain pressure, okay? So for example, this surface means 
on this surface, you find 500 millibar. But you can see at different places, you need to go different elevation to find this 500 millibar, right? So if you go here, you can see 500 millibar charts. Okay, that's a low level, but that means to which elevation you find this air pressure. So at the end of the day, you will have this uh, like a terrain surface, okay? On average, that is this. So, oh, here, and this is my example for you. So you can see here, upper level charts, 500 millibar surface. This is the corresponding map. So you can see those solid, okay, solid uh, iso, uh, not iso bars, actually it's the contour lines. The solid lines represent to which elevation you find 500. So for example here, okay, in California, okay, in California, let's go this one, close to San Francisco, okay, here. If you're at the San Francisco Bay Area, you need to go all the way up to 5,580 meters above the ground to find 500 millibars. But if you are down here at LA or the border between San Diego, let's say, uh, you, you need to go higher, okay? Because what? Because our air is warmer, they expand. They expand, so you need to go a little bit higher to find 500 millibars. But San Francisco, it's a little bit cold, okay? So you just, you don't need to go that far, okay? So that is a upper level chart. Okay, so then upper level charts, okay? Also, uh, in addition to those elevations, you also have these uh, uh, temperature, okay? At that level, what's the temperature? But you also have the wind. Wind that is indicated by those symbols. Okay, you can see you can, based on its appearance, how it look like, to calculate the wind speed. Okay, here the thing. If you have a bar, that means this many miles per hour. Okay, if you have one to two. Okay, if you have a shorter bar. Okay, that is five this miles per hour or knots. Knots is a standard unit for wind speed. Okay, so it's about five. And this long bar means 10. So if you have them together, you can see five plus 10, you have 15. <laughs> okay, so that is how you calculate the wind speed and also wind direction. If you see the arrows like this, let me annotate, okay. That means wind blow from west to east. The wind speed is 1, 10, 10, 10, sorry, 10, 10, 10, 30, 32 ish, right? Knots, okay? Not this many miles per hour, okay? 10, 10, 10. Okay, all right. So that is how you uh, read the wind. Okay, clear. All right. Okay. So, well, we, you also have a high pressure ridge and the trough. High, right? So, this is the ridge. It's always towards to the north, and the trough always towards to the, to the equator. Okay. So, well, here, uh, trough and ridge affecting the uh, how the wind flow. Okay. If you have the ridge, you can see they need to climb up the mountains. Right, so you can see there uh, the wind speed a little bit slower. But if you go down here, you can see those wind speed is very fast. Right? Okay, so that is one thing. Okay, so forces on wind is the next very important thing. Uh, wind is a horizontal movement of the air molecules. It is affected by three forces: air pressure gradient, how fast air pressure change. Coriolis force that due to the Earth's spinning, okay, and also friction, okay, friction. You know what friction is, right? Okay, so the how each of those forces affect the wind speed and wind direction, okay? Pressure gradient force, like I said earlier, is a change in pressure, okay? It's a change in pressure over the distance. So that is why when you see the very close 
uh, narrow spacing isobars. That means that change very, very fast. So you will have fast wind, okay? You can visualize that as this slope. This slope is very steep, okay? You have fast wind. Otherwise, you have slower wind, okay? Like in this situation. So pressure gradient force can only, um, you know, speeding up okay your uh, your uh, uh, wind speed <laughs> if you have uh, air pressure your wind will go that way will go that way so if you draw that wind uh, if you draw wind direction just based on the isobars pressure gradient it's always 90 degrees to isobars okay but you know my our wind never just blow 90 degree to isobars, right? Because the other two forces, Coriolis force and friction also play a role, okay? So give you more uh, illustration on how the pressure gradient force affect the wind direction. Okay? You can see PGF, PGF, 90, 90 degree to your isobars, okay? So Coriolis force, what is Coriolis force? Not due to the Earth's rotation. Okay, so it's always 90 degree to your wind movement that direction. So if you go this way, the pressure gradient go that way. Okay, always 90 degree. But Coriolis force is different at different latitude. At the equator, you don't have any any uh, Coriolis force. But when you go to the two poles, you have the greatest. Uh, Air, uh, Coriolis force, okay? And it also increases with the speed, okay? So here is the thing, it only, because it's 90 degree to your wind direction, it only affects wind direction, it can only deflect your wind, turn your wind to a different direction. And to which direction, right? Depends on which hemisphere you are at. If you're in the northern hemisphere, it will turn your wind to the right. If you're in the northern, southern hemisphere, it will turn your wind to the left. Okay, memorize this, very important. Okay, so this is a little bit uh, explanation why it's like why northern hemisphere to the right, uh, southern hemisphere to the left. Watch this video, okay, because they are spinning from fast from this direction to this direction, okay? And equator spinning fast. So for example, you want to go north, right? But our Earth also carrying you to the east. So you can see you need to combine those two. So at the end of the day, you're moving this direction. So you can see compared to your original direction, that is to the right, right? But very important, wind moving direction. It's not your right or left. It's wind right, uh, uh, left or right, okay? So basically we need to follow our wind. Okay, friction always decrease the wind speed. Like it always decrease the speed of you and me, right? But one interesting thing is if you go higher enough, you will have less friction above like 3,000 feet, 1,000 meter above the ground, you will have almost zero direction, uh, friction. So we call them free atmosphere. That's also why our uh, airplane, they want to climb up, right? Because they want to save the fuel. Okay, so if you just have the PGF or CF, no friction that have an upper level, right? In this free atmosphere, you will have this wind called geostrophic wind, okay? So you can see PGF, 90 degree to isobars always. And in Northern hemisphere, your CF, 90 degree to your wind direction, see 90 degree to this purple arrow, 90 degree to this purple arrow, 90 degree to this purple arrow. Right? It also changes, okay? So because of those two forces, at the end of the day, you will have your geostrophic wind blowing night up parallel to the isobars. Okay, so again, you turn in your and you're 90, you parallel, parallel to the, to the, to the isobars. Okay? So, well, then if upper level, you see those isobars very close to each other, well, that will also speed up your wind, okay? Because just like our river, 
okay? If you go to those very narrow tunnels, that will speed it up, right? Okay. So this is the geostrophic wind you show, we see that earlier in the uh, upper level chart. So, but you have two directions, meri uh, meridional and zonal. Meridional means meridian, right? Vertical, north, south. Uh, zonal means west or east, okay? And well, why we care? Because, because you know, in, uh, uh, yesterday, Denver, right uh colorado have a you know the middle east the middle west of us we have winter storm uh denver this morning i learned that they have two inch of two feet of snow not inch two feet of snow okay so why because of this jet stream so looks it's a, a turn out to it turned out that this jet stream this geostrophic wind upper level meandered a lot. You have this um, meridional, you know, wind go all the way down to Denver, okay? You have this trough over here. That actually bring in a very cold air mass all the way to Denver, okay? That air mass, when they, you know, contacting, you know, or battling with the warm air, okay, from the south, from the Gulf of Mexico, that give us the winter storm, the snow, two feet of snow in them. Okay, so very, very important factor uh, affecting our winter winter weather. Okay, winter weather, especially for the for the uh, middle middle west and the east coast. Actually, okay, so we do have two types of the uh, jet stream. One is close to the pole, we call that polar jet, that mainly because the cold air from the North Pole and hot air from, you know, tropical area, they, you know, come battling with it, with each other, okay? The other one is subtropical jet, it's close to the equator. That actually is later, we learn it's hardly so, but basically, yes, you have this rising air from equator, see this equator, and then when they hit the tropical piles, they will, you know, spread out, right? But on their upper level wind on their way to the north, they will be turned to the right. So that is this subtropical jet. Uh, this one uh, have very little impact on us because there's not in our area and also it's very high above the, the ground. All right, so this is what I talk, what I talk about, the cold weather. Okay, read about it on your textbook. It's fascinating. Okay, see here, it's a big trough over here. Okay, then surface wind, the surface on the ground, you have friction force need to uh, consider, right? So it's always never, you know, parallel to the isobars. It's always intersect with isobars with a certain angle. Okay, so that is your surface wind, and it's slow, it's slow, okay? So you can see, compare the upper level and the ground level, it's like this, okay? Parallel to the isobars above uh, in the upper chart, but ground level is like this, okay? Upper level is like this, but ground level never parallel, okay? Intersecting, okay? All right. But upper level airflow and the lower surface, they definitely connected, okay? So this is how they connected. So you can see if at the ground, you have this low pressure center, right? low pressure area, the air will blow in, right? And then they will be subject to this, uh, you know, uh, three forces and they intersecting with isobars, they blow in. But the air is a fluid. They're always floating, flowing, right? So when you have more and more air concentrated over here, they cannot go anywhere else. They will rise. So you can see upper level, actually you have more and more air. Relatively, you actually have a higher pressure, but that is a later story, okay? You have this diverging wind, okay? Opposite, if you have a high pressure here, uh, pushing the air out, Okay, you have upper level descending. Okay, upper level, you have a relatively low pressure compared to this side, same level. Okay, and the air sinking here. 
see that link connected. Okay. All right. So the scale of atmosphere motion, so wind, how the wind blow, they blow on every every scale, micro scale, meso scale, and global scale. So when we learn the wind pattern, we will have three uh, scales. Okay. So let's start from very little, very small scale. That is the turbulence. So you can see we have turbulence everywhere. Who can trigger those turbulence? Your terrains, your trees, even the buildings. Okay. And also you, you see those beautiful cloud. Okay. Uh, last last week we see a lot of cloud, and one of your classmates she shared with me a very beautiful turtle cloud. That is amazing. That is amazing. Thank you. Uh, well, why? <laughs> right? Because atmosphere is also not smooth. When you have those turbulence, okay, sometimes sometimes it push the air up. Sometimes it's you know bring the air down. You will have the cloud formation, right? So that is a good due to the turbulence. Okay. So more about thermal. Okay, you have a warmer air, they rise up, you will have these thermal turbulence, mechanical turbulence that due to the mountains and the buildings. Okay. All right, then let's study this uh, local thermal circulation due to the uh, pre due to the temperature difference. Okay, so for example, for example, at the beginning you have this uh, you know horizontal isobars beautifully, right? But if at certain in certain condition in north is cold, okay, south is warm, you will have the warm air rises, right? Like I showed you earlier here, you have rising air, upper level, you have more and more air constant accumulated over here. You have more air, you have a higher pressure compared to the same level. Right? So you can see here, you have rising air, relatively high pressure, upper level, that's upper level, cold places, because the air sinking, you have a relatively low pressure. See, we compare the pressure at the same level, okay? And you can see air pressure, wind, due to the pressure difference, will blow to this direction, okay? But at the ground level, it's the opposite. Because the air is sinking, it's descending, relatively you have a high pressure here, but low pressure down here, right? Okay, so air below this way, okay? That applied to our uh, land sea breezes. So you can see during the day, our ocean is cool, right? Land is warm, so air circulating this way. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> air circulating this way, uh, clockwise right, clockwise. So that is why, especially in the uh, late afternoon when the land is very, very hot, this low pressure is very low, but the ocean is relatively cool. You will have the sea breezes when you, you know, come to Santa Monica, go to the beach, right? But uh, during the night, it's opposite because those land, they lose the heat very fast. LA in during the night, the downtown, the concrete, they can lose the heat very fast. So air below to the ocean. So we call that land breezes, okay? Uh, here is the uh, land sea breezes produce this tower cloud in uh, Florida. This is amazing, okay? They have the sea breezes to the two directions. So they push, push the air up. <laughs> well, uh, a little bit larger level, okay, over continent, you will have this monsoon. Okay, also due to the thermal circulation. So you can see during the winter, this is the Eurasia continent, largest continent on the earth. You have a very cold winter, okay? High pressure here. Ocean, Indian Ocean is warmer. So you can see that is your winter monsoon over Indian, uh, Indian subcontinent, right? And Southeast Asia. Uh, here in the summer is opposite. Okay, this is the seasonal change, seasonal change of the wind pad, we call that muscle. But local, local change, like in Florida, like in Santa Monica, we call that land sea breezes, okay? In here, uh, LA, California, southwest of United States, we also have muscle, okay? So you can see here in the summer, in the summer, uh, 
not just in the summer actually, when the ocean is warm, you know, ocean is always warm. Gulf, when the Gulf is warm, you have this humid air blowing in, right? Why? <laughs> Why? Because, because, do you know during the uh, during the summer, okay, during the summer, uh, our ocean is relatively cool compared to the land. I know ocean is warm, but compared to the land, it's relatively cool. You will have the wind pattern, you know, moving through this direction. Okay, do you know winter is a little bit opposite? Okay, a little bit opposite. So here, this is the explanation of the North American monsoon. Okay, read about it to learn more details. Mountain and valley breezes, that is the same thing. Okay, always cold places, you have a high pressure. Warm places, you have low pressure. So during the night, during the day, you have different, different wind pattern. We also have this Chinook wind, that is our Santa Ana wind. Okay, so that is happen when in the uh, early fall, right? So that is when the land cool down a lot. Um, Colorado Play-Doh, you have this uh, high pressure dome that press the wind downhill. Okay, through those tunnels, they speed up our wind. That gives you very serious uh, the wildfire uh, concerns, right? Okay, the stress. That stable is another very interesting phenomenon regarding to the local wind pattern. Okay. That basically is a, a smaller mini tornadoes. Okay, that is when the uh, wind, the cold air, not just cold air, when the air, okay, turbulence moving to this direction, you suddenly have this rising warm air, okay, turn this column, you know, rotating column to vertical, and then they start spinning like your blender, okay, like your blender. So, yeah, so that is the, that's that, that's that, it's like a mini tornado. Okay, so this is the most important thing in this chapter, okay? The global wind pattern. So I want you to know uh, why globally our wind blow like this, like you see on windy.com, right? So here is a video on your study guide to guide you step by step, okay? How those, uh, so, uh, the cells and the air, the patterns blow. Okay, watch that video. Here, briefly, equator is hot. So hot air rises at equator. So as a result, you have this equatorial law, right? When the rising air heat the trouble pulse, you will have those two air, you know, diverging to the higher latitude. Okay, but due to the gravity and Coriolis force, the air, this upper level air, let me annotate. This upper level air will be pulled down to 30 degree north and south. So that is why you have this subtropical high. Okay, and then when this air striking on the ground, one branch go to the upper level, okay, upper latitude, the other one just go back you know, to equator and continue rising at equator. So you can see this is your one circulation. We call that Hadley cell, okay? And let's go to the two poles. Polar area is cold, right? Polar area is cold, so air is descending. Well, then when they hit the ground, they will go to the lower latitude. So you can see at about uh, 60 degree north and south, you have to air, you know, they collide into each other, okay? But the one from the south, this one is warm, but this one is cold, okay? You know, warm air is less dense, so they will be pushing up, okay? So that is why you have this polar front. That is how your polar front, your jet stream, your subpolar jet stream formed, okay? But you know, when the air is rising, you have this subpolar low, okay? And here, air is descending, you have polar high, okay? So the wind pattern basically is between those high low pressure belt, always from high to low, right? But Northern hemisphere, you need to turn your wind to the right, Southern hemisphere, turn your wind to the left. So you can see 
high pressure here, low pressure here. Originally, I want to go to this direction, right? But the wind will be deflected to the right of the wind. So let's follow the wind direction, go to the right, should be this direction, right? Follow the wind, turn yourself no, to follow the wind direction, okay? So here is basically, you can see this wind blow up to the sky, but hit the top of house. They will come back, okay, to finish this ferrocell, okay? And the other one will go back to the equate to the north pole or south pole finish this polar cell so these three cell models okay very uh simple okay but it's a lot of details over there so watch the videos read your textbook make sure you understand it okay all right uh why we care because uh global wind also blow up our ocean currents okay global wind also blow up uh, our ocean currents. So you can see those gray arrows represent the wind direction, and the green, then the solid arrows represent the ocean currents. So you can see why you have this north equator uh, currents. That because this trade wind, okay, this wind blow from subtropical area to equator area. They blow this way, right? Okay, see, they blow this way and they push the currents go that way, okay? That is important because you have this El Nino, okay? What is El Nino? In the normal air, you will have this very strong trade wind blow all the water, warm water to Indonesia, okay? That is why Indonesia uh, is, uh, you know, they rain a lot in the summer, okay? And because this uh, warm uh, water accumulated away. But during the El Nino year, we don't have very strong wind. So you have very warm ocean pool close to Mexico, okay, Baja California, right here, okay? So Indonesia have less warm water, have less rising air, they will experience a drought, okay? But here in our winter, you will have a lot of storm, a lot of moisture, okay? So that is El Nino. All right, so I believe that is all the uh, highlights of this chapter. But make sure after watching this video, you still need to read your textbook, okay? But we'll give, you will have a better picture about what you're going to learn and also watch the videos on, your, on the study guide page, okay? So I will have office hours. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, let me know, okay? Let me know. Uh, as uh, speaking of assignment, you need to participate discussion and also to summarize the questions I highlighted in the very first slide. Right here, okay, I think up to here. Okay, remember to answer all these questions. Okay, next week we are going to study the global wind patterns. You have a fun discussion, okay, coming in the next week. Okay, so that's it. Let me know any questions. Uh, wish you a happy and productive week. Bye for now.